The next presentation is Network Scale Virtual Output Cues from Isanovia, Mr. Brian Peterson. Thank you. Hello again. In this presentation, I'll be talking about how the concept of virtual output cues may be applied across an entire network. So we'll be defining some of the goals of in-vehicle network QoS, talk about some of the common root causes of latency and packet loss. We'll talk about networking from a queuing perspective. I'll introduce and describe the characteristics of VOQs, and we'll talk about shaping algorithms. Now, a couple of the objectives of QoS in in-vehicle networks is to bound latency and to minimize packet loss. Now, we're not trying to bound latency to zero or establish zero jitter. We just want to make sure that the latency does not exceed some upper limit. And with regards to packet loss, we're not trying to eliminate all possible causes of packet loss. There's one particular cause of packet loss that I think we can address very effectively. So first up, what causes latency? And this is basic queuing theory. If you have packets arriving in a queue faster than they can be emitted, the queue is going to build up content and you're going to have latency. So basically, it's a function of how fast queues can be emitted from a queue and how many things are ahead of the packet you are considering. So you can imagine like a toll plaza at a bridge and the toll plaza can only process so many cars per minute, how long you have to wait, is a function of a number of cars in front of you. It's a fairly straightforward idea. And this accumulation of things in the queue is congestion. And so if you assume that your link rate, the rate at which you can emit data from the queue, is a fixed value, then the latency is a function of congestion. Now, with regards to packet loss, there are two primary causes that are of interest. One is bit errors. And if we assume a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 12th and 1,000 byte packets, you will, on average, lose about one out of 12 million packets due to a bit error. Now, this 10 to the minus 12th figure is an upper bound, and in practice, that number is vanishingly close to zero. Now, buffer overruns, on the other hand, are very easy to cause and demonstrate. So just imagine a scenario where you're receiving nonstop line rate packets on a 10 gigabit link, and you're forwarding all of those packets to a one gigabit link. In very short order, you're gonna be losing nine out of 10 of those packets. And so it's buffer overruns that we need to address with regards to packet loss. And in both cases, latency and packet loss, congestion is the root cause. Congestion increases queue occupancy, which means you're putting your resources at risk and you're at risk of losing packets. And when your queues are full, it takes a long time for packets to get through those queues. So where should we look when we want to manage queue congestion within our network? Now, the TSN standards we're all familiar with uh, spend a lot of time focusing on the bridge. And that's understandable, um, after all. The role of 802.1Q is to define the behavior of bridges. The challenge, though, is that focusing on the bridge is kind of like closing the barn door after the horses have already run away. Now, a bridge can limit its transmission rate, which is beneficial to downstream bridges and to the destination endpoints. But a bridge only has two defense mechanisms to protect its own queuing and buffering resources. And they are flow control indicated to the upstream link partner, either on a per priority basis or on a link level basis, or dropping packets. And neither of these solutions are ideal. Now, what do we see when we look at the source endpoints in our network? This is where all of a network's traffic comes from. This is what causes congestion in the network. The source endpoints are delivering packets more rapidly to the network than the network can accommodate. If we can control the packet rates at the source endpoints, we can control congestion. Now, a network is effectively a series of interconnected queues. Each queue's contents comes from some upstream queue. And the rate at which a queue can emit data is limited by a bunch of factors. 
The first among these, and the most obvious one, is the transmit bit rate of the link associated with that output queue. You can't emit data faster than the link can handle it. Another is competition between queues. If you have multiple queues sharing a link, that's the sum of those queues bandwidths cannot exceed that link capacity. Another is a shaper. Shapers allow us to artificially reduce the emission rate of an output queue. And next up is a little less intuitive, but it's also very effective, is you cannot emit data from a queue faster than that data is being enqueued into the queue, at least on average. In the short term, you can have bursts of packets being transmitted faster than you're receiving. But in, on average, the egress rate cannot exceed the ingress rate. So if we can effectively limit the ingress rates into our queues, we can control congestion. Now this effectively ignores the uh, simultaneous arrival of packets across multiple receive interfaces. And these are transient events, and their characteristics are a function of the number of received ports that are focusing traffic to a particular queue and the, the characteristics of those bursts. But these receive rate controls have to be applied to every queue across the entire network. We can't just focus on one queue and, and call it a day. We have to go upstream and control the congestion and the ingress rates at those queues as well. And ultimately, we end up back at the source of the traffic, which is the ingress endpoints into our network. So sources of traffic can fall into a couple of broad categories. Um, one is a simple one, such as, for example, a steering angle encoder that may want to deliver data to one particular destination. And so it's not going to have any conflicts accessing its interface. It's going to have one output queue, and the data is going to be delivered without any conflicts. But a more interesting example would be a CPU or software-based ECU that may have many software processes running in parallel, each of them generating bursts of data. And each of these software processes has its own burst characteristics, the number of bytes per burst and then the frequency of those bursts. And if each of those software processes are sharing a single output queue, we run into the potential problem for head-of-line blocking. Head-of-line blocking occurs when you have one particular data source has accumulated some data, but its destination is demanding a slower delivery rate. And if that slows down your output queue, the other data sources that need to run faster won't be able to. Now, easy way to think of this is if you're driving up a hill on a single lane road and there's a big heavy truck in front of you, that truck is going to limit your speed. There's no room to pass. You're not going to go any faster than that truck. And all the other cars stuck behind that truck are also going to go no faster than that truck. Now, virtual output queues give us a passing lane so we can avoid head-of-line blocking. And perhaps the best real-world example of virtual output queues in practice is a chassis scale router. And earlier in my career, I have some experience working on these sorts of designs, so I'm well familiar with the characteristics. Now, a chassis consists of a series of line cards connected to a fabric. And it's often beneficial to depict the line cards as two separate functions, ingress and egress, and that's what I've done here. The input functions are on the left, and the output functions are on the right. So line card A on the left and on the right is the same physical thing. These are just two different views of it. Now, the switch fabric in the middle is non-blocking and has very limited buffering. The buffers are extremely shallow. On the egress direction of the line card on the right-hand side, each output port has multiple output queues. And the, the buffering in the egress direction is small to moderate. The vast majority of the buffering resides on the ingress line card. Okay, because in the chassis, we can't necessarily control the rate at which data is arriving. We have to be able to buffer that up. But very importantly, each ingress line card has an input queue for every possible output queue across the entire system. So if I had you know, 24 line cards and 100 ports per uh, line card, I'm going to have, and I have eight queues per, uh, per port, I could have thousands of input queues on each ingress line card. 
Now, the beauty of this system is that if output Q2 on the right there has to operate more slowly than the other output Qs, its corresponding input Qs on the other side of the fabric also operate more slowly. And it can do so without slowing down the traffic in the other queues. So we've avoided head offline blocking with this approach. Now, switch fabrics have some other interesting characteristics that are worth talking about. Uh, first up is they are non blocking. They adopt a CLO topology, which is the minimum number of interconnects to guarantee non blocking performance. Now, this rat's nest of wires is the minimum number of connections that are required to guarantee non-blocking communication across this fabric. Now, I'm not gonna suggest we adopt a CLO topology in vehicles, that would be insane. But importantly, the fabric operates at a single level of priority. The differentiation between classes of traffic is done by the ingress VOQs. And the input queues on the ingress cards are VO queues, they're virtual output queues, because each of those input queues is an extension of the output queues on the other side of the fabric. And it's the ingress VO queues that compete with one another for access to the fabric and the transmit ports. So that's where priority differentiation is done. And the reason a single priority can work in a fabric is because the buffering is so, so small in the fabric, there's no benefit in having a high priority packet skip to the head of the line, there will be very few packets to skip over. So there's no need to introduce the complexity of multiple levels of priority in the fabric. And the reason shallow buffers work is the ingress rates into the fabric are very tightly controlled. And those rates are negotiated between the ingress and egress aspects of the line cards. So if we want to ap apply these concepts to an in-vehicle network, it's good to look at some of the commonalities and differences between these architectures. What's common between a chassis and an in-vehicle network is they have mostly static topologies. Now, yes, in the chassis, you can insert and remove line cards, and the network into which these chassis are installed are big, large, complex, and chaotic. There's all kinds of major services that are being set up and torn down on a moment-by-moment -moment basis and the designer of the chassis cannot anticipate what those services are. But inside the chassis itself, we have a static topology and we have a, a static behavior. The chassis and the in-vehicle network both also have very small buffers in the network. The fabric in a chassis has very small buffers and the bridges in our in-vehicle networks have small buffers. Now there are some profound differences as well. Um, the traffic patterns, within a chassis are unpredictable. We do not know where the traffic's gonna come from at any moment. And that's why the bandwidth has to be negotiated on a real-time basis between the ingress and egress line cards. In a vehicle, we know what the communication requirements are going to be. We can take a look at the sum total of all the things that need to talk to all the other things, and we can figure out what those requirements are. And we can bake that into the topology of the network and the bandwidth uh, tuning that we're doing at the edges. The other difference is that the chassis fabric is non-blocking, whereas it's very regular, no matter how you slice it, it's like a fractal subset of the whole thing. In vehicle networks are very irregular in their topology and have links of different speeds. Now, if we wanted to adopt the concept of virtual output queues, they have to be applied to the ingress network endpoints, the sources of the data because these are the equivalent of the ingress function of a chassis line cards. And we will need one output queue for every connection that that port has to service. And by connection, I mean two communicating software processes. As so it's possible to have many dozens or hundreds of software processes at each physical endpoint. So the number of connections is going to be far larger than the number of physical endpoints in a system. And this means we will need a lot of output queues per transmit port. And each output queue has to have its own shaper. And the shaper must be tuned to the requirements of the connection that's using that output queue. Now, source endpoints have some interesting characteristics, um, and some of these might not be intuitive. For all intents and purposes, it, like a software-based um, 
ECU, has unbounded source buffer size. First of all, it's application memory associated with the processor implemented in DRAM can be quite large, especially in comparison to the small buffers in a bridge in the middle of the network. Also, the CPU is either gathering or generating data all the time, so it's an unlimited source of data. So congestion is not a concept that applies to the source of, this, of the uh, network traffic. This source can also have virtually unlimited NQ bandwidth. Now, NQ is very different from transmit because in a lot of cases, when we want to transmit a message or a packet, we're not NQing the actual message or packet. We're NQing a descriptor of that packet or message we want to transmit. And those descriptors are very tiny compared to the packets. So even if there is a bottleneck, between the CPU and the uh, network interface, like PCIe, we can NQ a tremendous number of descriptors very quickly. It can represent a large amount of data. So we're NQing representations of data that far exceed the network's bandwidth. And also, depending on the capabilities of the hardware, it's possible for a single descriptor to describe a message that requires multiple packets to convey. So to illustrate how this works, I'm gonna run through a couple of scenarios. And these scenarios, we've got two sources of traffic, green and blue. Both of them want to emit data at a rate that represents 30% of their associated links bandwidth. The green packet source wants to transmit small packets frequently, and the blue traffic source wants to transmit multi-packet messages infrequently. But in both cases, they add up to 30%. And in this simple scenario, each traffic source has its own output queue and its own transmit port. So, so there's no conflict between the two. And what we see is those you know, hash marks across the bottom represent the transmission time of the individual packets. And those packets are delivered with essentially zero delay because there is no conflict. So you see the green packets being delivered and representing 30% of the available bandwidth and the same thing with the blue packets. Now, a more realistic scenario is both of these software processes have to communicate via a shared physical port. And in this case, they're also going to share an output queue. Now, what's happening here is that the descriptor of our blue message is being enqueued immediately ahead of the descriptor of packet number four, the green packet. And because that blue descriptor got in there first, its packets are being transmitted first. And you can see they're being spaced out because we have a shaper. And a shaper is tuned to 60% of the link's bandwidth, which is the sum of the offered load of the two separate processes. You notice there's a delay between packets three and four, which is proportional to the length of packet three. Again, that shaper is imposing that delay. Now there's a substantial burst of green packets and they're being transmitted at the 60% line rate. And you notice at the very end of that burst of green packets, there's that one green packet that's sitting out there by itself. And that happens because at this point, the output queue is empty and that very last packet is being transmitted without delay. And then this process repeats. Now if we have separate output queues, the behavior is a bit different you'll notice that the interleaving of the packets is much more granular. Packet four is transmitted immediately after packet one and is followed by a short 100% line rate burst. Now the reason for this burst is that because packet four's descriptor was enqueued at the same time as the blue message, it's been waiting behind packet one and its shaper has been accumulating credit. And so that burst is that shaper paying down that accumulated credit. After that burst, those packets start to be transmitted at zero delay at their native 30% rate. Now, if we look at the latency characteristics of our source system's access to the network, we can see there's about a 2x increase in latency for the blue packets when we compare the shared output queues versus the separate output queues but there's a nearly five to one reduction in latency for the green packets. So on balance, there's a significant reduction in latency. But latency of access to the network is not the most important thing at this point. What really matters is what effect we're having on the network itself. What kind of congestion is happening at the bridge downstream of our source endpoint? 
And so here we have a bridge, has a single receive port, and we're receiving this interleave mix of blue and green packets, and our bridge is splitting them out to two separate physical ports, and those physical ports have output queues, and they're rate shaped to 30%, which is the bandwidth requirement of the two software processes. Now for the shared output queue, you notice a rather substantial accumulation of green packet bytes. And to remember that long burst at 60% rate of the green packets, that's what's causing this accumulation because we're receiving packets at 60% and we're transmitting them at 30%. And so we're receiving packets twice as fast as we can transmit them. Now for the separate output queues, you recall there was a short burst of green packets at 100%. And that's causing a, a quick little accumulation of packets for the green queue. And then it levels off because after that short burst, we were transmitting the packets at 30% line rate. Now the peak of the accumulation for the separate output queues shown at the bottom here is only 17% of the accumulation for the shared output queue scenario shown above. That's a substantial reduction in accumulation in our buffers, which means there's this, a corresponding reduction in the risk of packet loss. Now for all of this to work, we have to have shapers. And there are numerous shaping algorithms to choose from. And in our analysis, with regards to asynchronous shapers, it doesn't really matter too much which one you choose. HCS and CBS both work roughly equally well. Now synchronous shapers, such as TAS, do add a fair amount of configuration complexity, but they're latency and congestion characteristics are not any better than the asynchronous shapers. The most important thing about a shaper is on a packet by packet basis, it must impose whatever delay is necessary on each packet such that the transmission rate is less than or equal to the configured rate of the shaper. If a shaper can accomplish that, it's doing its job. And if the ingress rate into the queue is less than or equal to the shaper's rate, there will be no queue depth accumulation. Now, not all credit-based shaper implementations are created equal. If your implementation is allocating credit into your token buckets in big chunks, you're going to enable big bursts, and that's going to create more congestion. So ideally, you're frequently adding credit you're frequently adding a small amount of credit. Now, all of this demands, because we're going to have to configure many, many output queues that are source endpoints, this demands careful network-wide bandwidth planning. Now, for a small, simple network, this could be a spreadsheet exercise. For a larger, more complex network, this may require some specialized tools. Now, when we're talking about shapers and queues, it's natural to think about 802.1Q. How does this apply here? 802.1Q imposes an 8Q per transmit port limit, and this is a direct result of the three-bit priority field in the VLAN tag. Now, VOQs are implemented in the source endpoints, not in bridges, and that means 802.1Q does not apply. So in conclusion, there are a number of common characteristics between uh, chassis-based systems and in-vehicle networks that I think there are lessons to be learned and there are things that we can apply. If we have precision shapers on, on the ingress sources of all of our traffic, we can prevent congestion in the network. VOQs solve the head-of-line blocking problem and minimize bursts. VOQs have the effect of reducing average latency and reducing congestion in the network. And so I believe that the VOQ architecture has the potential of solving congestion-related packet drops in our networks. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brian Peterson, uh, thank you very much for an in interesting presentation. Uh, Nat, uh, let's open questions and comments from the audience. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, Yes, I'm Don Panel from NXP. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, last year, I at this conference, I unfortunately couldn't present my paper, but a colleague did for me because I couldn't travel. Um, but basically the question was the same thing. You, you don't want to blow out the output buffers when you have mixed links on data rates, like a central core CPU bursting out at 10 gig. Uh, 
and it's talking to an end station over many hops of bridges it's only 10 megabit you're going to blow out the buffers yep uh so there i mean actually there 802.1 also you're you're right 802.1q originally was mainly focused on bridges um, when we did avb tsn we realized that particularly uh there is a requirement that's in the credit base shaper for talkers that's beyond what's in bridges. Mm -hmm. um, bridges only do per class or, or per priority queue shaping. Talkers need to do per flow shaping before the per class shaping. And I think that's effectively what you're doing. You, you end up individually shaping the individual rates before. That's the, correct, yes. You know, so that is in the standard and is covered by 802.1Q and TSN on the credit base. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, so there is some of those connections, and now Q is starting to be more aware that, you know, that output Q, that structure that's in a talker, the mm -hmm. source, yeah. is part of the network. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And that's what your point was here, too. I mean, <clears throat> and, and I really appreciate what you said, you know, uh, historically, there's been the feeling that bridges have to solve the world's problems. Yes. Uh, and no, you're you're right. Once the horses are out out of the barn, <laughs> there's nothing the bridge can fix. That's right. So thank you very much. Thank you for the comments. Any other questions? All right. Hearing none. Thank you very much.